don't know being what able to about. create a book. So what's next? What's well, the say, next revolution? They it's say that something it like be, AI. Yes. That it's embedded, or that it, it's just everywhere. The Internet of Things is just everywhere, and with five G connecting everything, you could even have a, a chip in a pen and just in your in your eyeglasses. There's Google Glass that. They didn't catch on. Maybe it will eventually, or something like it. Mm -hmm. You can get information you know, by looking in your. You know, yeah. I, I, I think uh, you're onto something. The, the, the answer to your question, from my perspective, Mike, uh, the revolution for me, for, for me uh, individually, has consisted in the following that there are two kinds of knowledge the conventional knowledge and the non-conventional knowledge. Um, that non-conventional knowledge, which is precisely a super perspectivism of looking at any object, any knowledge, anything from a uh, omniscient kind of uh, 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 perspective um, is fed by is fed by actually a, a conventional knowledge so it's like a the 1970s uh, 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 lamps you know those lamps with the bubbles uh, i don't know the name of them sure, the uh, um, lava lamps lava, yeah. lava lamps so you you have i did too many drugs i forgot the uh, <laughs> looking at lava lamps <laughs> But so that, 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 that is reality. So you are looking at reality. In a lava lamp, you're looking at reality. Every bubble is a universe. Let's put it that way. It's a universe, uh, like our universe that uh, comes into being and fizzles out, but doesn't go anywhere. It's still in the same lamp. It's the it's same, it's same reality. So you look in, the lava lamp is a, a good representation of reality, the whole universe. In within the universe, you have bubbles of reality, sub-realities, which would be one of those yellow bubbles would be our universe. That's in expansion. It has a certain time span of 15 billion years, and then it may fizzle out, but it's going to come back. It's going to come back from the bottom. It didn't even go anywhere. It was still in the lamp. You know? So that's a, the circular, the yin-yang the never ending circle of uh, being and non being the rebirth, you know, the, the, uh, that uh, they talk about in Buddhism, but how can you call that rebirth? You didn't go anywhere. You just, mm. you know, you were not phenomenal for a while and then you became phenomenal, but your mm. numinal nature was inside that, that reality. So this is to me, the more I study, the more I find Boltzmann or Planck or anything, any idea, Buddha, the Dharma, the Vedas, you and I talking about uh, life and work and, you know, salesmanship, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it, the, it, the, the more you oh, have uh, conventional have a knowledge. We have a friend, uh, uh, Ken, joining us. Hey, Ken, Ooh. thanks for joining us. I muted. <laughs> oh, he's, he's muted. <laughs> I think you have the you have the power you have the power Ido. you're all powerful am I nice. supposed to I'm going to start nice. sharing the lava lamp nice very cool I I was listening to some Tibetan music mm -hmm. Tibetan bells oh and, nice, oh, nice. Ken, fire. can you unmute yourself Ken yes and, and and uh welcome ken thanks oh just kidding no. <laughs> ken's an alternate version of mike Without the glasses. <laughs> i just got a haircut so you know uh, i was similar hey. similar, similar I like your beard. the same reality wonderful that's it that's it both sides of the same coin good morning that's good it. morning that's good good morning ken you got a little bit more hair than I do. 
I don't know. I don't know. It's very close. It's it's well, a close it's, match. It's interesting. We were, we were just talking about the one. I come from Africa, like we all do. Our, my family comes from Africa. Um, they they left uh, a couple hundred thousand years ago, maybe maybe a hundred thousand years ago. I'm not sure. And it's yeah, good to Eve see theory. This is this is a family reunion. <laughs> so I'm so saying Eve theory, theory. <laughs> mitochondrial DNA doesn't lie. <laughs> so, <laughs> this idea of every time we see one another, I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> <laughs> At least in this reality or this that's, life. That's it. Oh. You just have amnesia. That's right. <laughs> like Up until walk. knowledge is received, that's true. I, I I just said we were trying to figure out because Hiro had a uh, a lava lamp on just as you were before you came in, Ken. And Lewis, oh, said, what is that thing that they did in the seventies with the bubbles and everything? And uh, I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't remember it because I did way too many drugs looking at lava lamps. <laughs> You were you were inside the lava lamp, Mike. <laughs> but I forgot what it's so, so when you're inside, you can't see it. That's the problem. <laughs> we're all lava lamps. <laughs> all right. So now we have uh, we have uh, 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 all four of us. Who who wants to summarize? Who wants to summarize the subject of the day? Uh, uh, we've been uh, at it for about fifty or forty some minutes. Uh, so who who wants to summarize the subject of the day? Uh, maybe Jairo, you're hosting, so go at it. Yes, it, it reminds me of of politics and bipartisanship and 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 walking across the aisle to try to get. Uh, I'm looking for another word, but but you you know what it's like. And but this in this case it was happening in the early 1900s or maybe before when there's a, uh, some were trying to promote uh, the atomic theory and others were, were trying to be more idealistic perhaps. And so Bolt, Boltzmann was more in favor of, of the atomic theory, but he didn't want to make it like, okay, this is, this is the fact, this is the way reality is. He was trying to walk across the aisle and get the idealist to see it his way by saying this is just a theory, just a representation. And so don't take it uh, so literally, but, but uh, see the benefit and, and see that it can be useful. That, that's what he was trying to do, I think. Well, if I may interrupt, what is the subject of the day? The subject of the day, maybe I'll, I'll summarize it real quick. We were talking about the uh, uh, perspectivism, uh, ah. meaning how we individually, we individually represent lives, uh, life to ourselves and others when we talk about it and we share. And uh, Boltzmann was very good in that sense, although he was a scientist, he was proposing that science represents reality in terms of uh, formulas or theories, and he because he, he had so much uh, uh, so much uh, conflict with all the scientists that said, no, uh, life is not made of atoms, because at the time it, it was way ahead of his time. Uh, he said, let's not be so dogmatic. Let's agree to, to disagree and let's use uh, different theories and different formulas to describe uh, the same concept or the same phenomenon from different perspectives. And uh, I found it very interesting. That's why I asked Jairo to, to make that the, the subject of the conversation because we, you, Jairo, uh, Mike and I are like scientists, non-scientists, non-scientist scientists. We are looking at reality, we live in reality, we're representing reality to ourselves to a certain degree, better or worse or whatever. And um, the more, flexible our views about reality become the better we can understand it and the better we understand reality the better we harmonize with reality the better we're able to cope with driving on i4 
the, the better we are able to cope with a nasty boss, the better we are able to cope with a difficult partner or a different, uh, difficult neighborhood or a difficult society. So the more flexible we are in understanding what we uh, see as reality, the better we can harmonize with it, manage our lives and become uh, less aggravated. It's interesting, right? but the, when I, I, like I said, we, we talk about different perspectives. We're talking basically about different branches of the same tree, correct? Correct. And different that, sciences. Yes. That being said, when you look at it, when you, when you, when you bring up science, uh, you know, when you, a lot of your words like flexibility and stuff like that does not apply in science. Science is not about that, being flexible. Science is about fact and what, what is quantifiable and what is proven. That is both its strength and its weakness, as far as I see it, because when, where matter ends, science is useless. That's what all about. Science is man's okay. mechanism to understand the world around him, the world that he perceives through his senses, you see? So to really understand, to go where you're going, or go where, 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 where was it, Bozeman and Tesla, where they were going, they were beyond the senses. Oh. Hawking was like that too. Yeah. So uh, a, a lot of us, so in order to really, really understand the world around you, you've got to understand your place in the world around you. So by understanding you, yourself, the, it's like, you know what, I always like it is, I always use this example in my classes, Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, that album. If you look at the cover of that album, it's got the prism and it's got the one light coming in and it's got the rainbow coming out. Okay, now that rainbow coming out are not different lights, they're all aspects of the one light. So by understanding that one light, the aspects themselves fall into place. You don't have to understand the, the red chakra, the yellow chakra, the orange, you have to understand each of them. You just understand the one light that's providing it all, you see? So that Understood. one light, that one point is you yourself. So by understanding yourself, all of these other stuff that you're talking about falling into place will all fall into place by itself, if you understand who you are and what you're about. Absolutely, 100%. You know, yeah, so. Talk about perspective, too. Absolutely. That's when exactly you, what this is about. When you listen to Dark Side of the Moon with headphones, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> I still do. <laughs> I mean, it is, you know, and that's a different, that's a, a completely different experience than you're yep. missing out on some things. Uh, oh, yeah. In, in terms of... I still, I, I still glean insights from that album. <laughs> that's fantastic. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I just do it. I listened to it last week with headphones yep. on. Fantastic. Oh, they have, they have a lot. Now, the other one, I, I've always followed and fell into Tesla because I finally understood the concepts of what he was talking about understanding reality through threes, sixes, and nines. A lot of people, that throws them off. But, you know, in meditation and in, 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 in preaching, as I have, I usually get the, these kind of, um, you know, I don't want to call them revelations, but I get like I kind of get downloads. And I understood the concept of what he was talking about. Insights. Three, sixes, exactly. Three, sixes, and nines. Now, threes, of course, is energy. That's what he's talking about. Proton, neutron, electron. That's represented in spirituality as father, son, Holy Spirit, Hinduism, generator, operator, destroyer, Native American, sun, earth, moon. So these are all representations of energy. And then energy that coalesces, it coalesces in the gas, it coalesces in the stars, it coalesces in the planets. Sometimes they further and coalesces into actual life. Those are the sixes. So when he's talking about threes and sixes, he's talking about energy to matter, to existence. And then the nines is the totality of that entire creation because if you look at a spiral galaxy from the center around and it always goes around it looks like a whirlpool but if you look at it it's a nine <laughs> understand it's a nine so when he was talking about understanding if you understand the concepts of threes sixes and nines he was understand he was telling you that the nature of existence as it is in this moment that's what he was talking about. no argument again uh, so yes, you, yeah, there is what is, which is reality, it, and there is what uh, emerges from reality, which is knowledge regarding itself, because we are not other than reality, we're just an aspect of reality.
knowledge mm -hmm. is an aspect of reality. So basically, uh, no matter how you paint it, no matter what you see, whether you see a three, a six, a nine, or a four and a half, or whatever it is, it's always what is looking at itself through knowledge, consciousness, uh, representation. So what is represents itself uh, through consciousness with a certain degree of clarity. So for example, if we pick a mosquito, through a mosquito, reality sees itself with uh, limited to our knowledge because we don't know how the mosquito thinks, but you know, based on uh, behavior and conduct and stuff and patterns, it's kind of limited. Uh, uh, reality sees itself with a certain degree of clarity uh, in the case of a mosquito or the leaf of a tree or an electron or a string through the vibration of emptiness or nothingness. So reality sees itself with a certain degree of clarity through any of its parts. The, so the whole sees itself through its aspects with a certain degree of clarity. And if the clarity is so infinite that you can consider the aspect a superconductor of the object itself, the noumenon, reality as a whole, then that's what, when you can call, you know, the enlightenment of the insight, you know, the reality sees itself and goes, ah, that's what I am. So that eureka moment, uh, the lion's roar of Buddha when he went, okay, I got this. I got this through the, you know, the meditation, the insight meditation that he did. He understood the Four Noble Truth, the three characteristics, uh, impermanence, uh, stress, and uh, non-being or no self or, back, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, emptiness in, uh, in Chinese, uh, sunyata, et cetera, et cetera. The moment that reality is, or the point, the, the wormhole, of consciousness through which reality is able to uh, go from being everything, pure existing, pure being, to a consciousness that is based on its, uh, its own uh, physicality, because you, know, you need a brain to think. Reality does not, does not know it exists directly. It only knows it exists through its aspectual uh, quality, which is phenomena. Whether they are physical, we call physical, mental, spiritual, uh, energy, or whatever it is. So we are the tool, you, Ken, Mike, Jairo, myself, the mosquito, and you know, anything phenomenal, is potentially the tool through which reality is able to see itself fully. So this over here, this, uh, this uh, representation of three sixes and nines, whether we're looking at a galaxy, we're looking at a string, or we're, we're thinking about uh, ethics, aesthetics, or, you know, uh, the uh, inequalities of the world, whatever it is, uh, is reality looking at itself trying, not even trying because it doesn't know it's trying. <laughs> it's it's the, the moment that a mind, that a consciousness goes, oh, this is reality thinking about itself. That's when this uh, mistaken identity disappears and reality starts looking at itself with a high degree of uh, precision and clarity. Hmm. That's interesting. I, you know, I'm, I'm, for some reason, anytime we're talking about this subject, I think of my, uh, I was married for over 20 years and uh, divorced and, and uh, part of uh, my issue was, um, I considered weeds that grew out of you know the ground and I, I, I considered them plants and so I didn't poison them and I would let them grow incredibly this would disturb my life very much it was not a good thing to do but I, I, I think I did it I think I also did it as a <laughs> probably uh, <laughs> anyway but some of these weeds would grow so tall that they would flower and this idea that you're talking about, Lewis, <clears throat> this idea of reality and cognition, and we were talking about the, uh, uh, the cognition revolution, this idea of I am me, oh, I am self, right. this understanding that takes place. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenal trip right. to, be, to be here. 
and uh, anyway, it's uh, it's art. It's uh, it's a drama. Um, it's uh, it's a fantastic song. We were just talking about Pink Floyd and and this idea of the dance. You know, uh, Ken, you talked about the the galaxy and the spiral and, and the nine. What a wonderful, beautiful dance that is that that we're doing all at once. Um, mm -hmm. In this reality and the others that have existed before and the ones that are coming up. So it's, it's all happening now at the same time. So this dance is something we've done before. The only thing that changes is our memories of it. That's it. Nothing more. This is why people like you, when you really look at somebody who understands these concepts, they don't worry about anything. They don't even worry about food on the table. I don't worry about bills. When I was in India, there was some who didn't even wear clothes. They wanted no attachments. They just came out only because they had to, to eat and beg for food and go back into the caves and meditate. That's it. That's all they did. And, mm. and I was like, you know, whoa, you know, I, and, I, and I've seen these guys. They come out with these beads to cover themselves up. Obviously, they come out, they do their begging and right back up into the hills, into the caves, and nobody sees them for 23 hours. And they, <laughs> they, they, they Cool. And then they come out, and you know, if you uh, if they're drawn to you, or if you're, and and if you give them a, like a little food, they will give you their teachings, the benefit of their knowledge. Mm. And yeah, and you know, and and I, I I don't know. It's like the same thing happened to me when I was in Japan. Uh, I don't know if it's because I had so much to. I was you know I was in the Marines. I was you know, twenty one. So my sobriety was non existent for those three hundred sixty five days. That to say the least, and sure. um, I remember having a, a conversation with this elder Japanese gentleman that would, was always in this park. They always outside of these bases that we were at that we had in Japan. They had these what they call friendship parks, just little pocket parks that they would just put up there. And one thing I noticed is that these hobos, these homeless people, would move into these parks, and they would take care of them. You know, the bathrooms were spotless. You could go in there and eat food off the, off the floor in these baths. These are public restrooms, and they are spotless. They clean the parks. If there's any trouble, they, they make sure, you know, they act like police. They don't do anything. And I would always go staggering up the hill because that, my base that I was at was on top of a hill, and I would be so drunk that I'd have to kind of take up five minutes and sit there and catch my breath before I'm back up the hill well there was this, always this group and there was always this man i made eye contact with for like six seven months and the moment before i left we finally kind of started talking and it turns out that him and his whole group this was back in the 80s were world war ii veterans and they were samurai mm. and they were so so disgruntled with the 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 with japan surrendering and adopting Western ways that they broke their swords and turned their back on society. Mm. And, and it was, it was, it was, the, it, it struck me. It was so deep how these guys were. They were so into the whole Bushido code. They, they really understood what it was. And they were like, it was better that they dropped 20 nukes than we lose our ways and who we are, which is why mm. they, they did what they did. You know, they, they drop, I mean, they, that's, that, that's when they turned their back, the symbolic meaning of that is them breaking their swords. And turning and that's exactly wow. what they did and the knowledge that they had you know what they were talking about what they knew you know was all the old world esoteric yeah. to me it made no sense at the time but now as i reflect back on the conversations i had with them you know and you know i mean he was yeah. like he was the one that made me aware of the whole racial problem and you know in, in you know, i had i had rose colored glasses they're like you're dark skin what are you doing in that country this is what they do he knew more of american history than i did this is beyond uh, the sort of this Western uh, um, pestilence that you describe that takes over a, a, uh, a culture. I've heard exactly. it described as well that, uh, for example, Watts, Alan Watts had a lecture on Japanese uh, carpentry. And uh, to be a Japanese uh, carpenter, this is an ancient uh, uh, skill. And uh, the way you described it, you'll have to, much better than I could, but essentially, it's you need to start learning when you're five or six. Well, that yep. society has changed so much that, you know, you go to school until you're 20 to be an insurance salesman, as the way Watts put it. And it's too late because you needed to be with your father 
from the time you were five or six that whole time. Yeah. And the whole thing's lost. Uh, very interesting yeah. story. Yep. Uh, what an I've experience. never forgotten him. I've never what forgotten a... that man. I never even asked his name. I don't know his name to this day. To this day. It was like one of those surreal moments, those aha moments. I had an aha moment before I had, I realized I had an aha moment, you know? But again, like I said, you know, the alcohol was on the brain, that kind of thing, you know? So I was like, really, it was, I really wasn't about it. But the, the, the funny thing is, it was like a lucid dream. I remember every word of the conversations that we had, you know? Mm. And it was just, you know, to, to the, I wonder, you know, I wonder what became of them. I, these guys, they were all very, very stoic. Very, when I, when, they, when they, they, they told me they were Japanese, I mean, I could see it then. They sat there cross-legged, like in, like in Lotus, backs straight, you know, very lucid, very, very, you know, very, they, and they just watched life go by. That's it. That's all they did. That's all they did. Kind of like those men in India in the caves, just their own way of, uh, like I said, perceiving the reality through their perspective. Amazing. Yeah. Ken, um, you said before you teach? Excuse are, me? Are you, are you said before that you teach? Are you a teacher? I, I teach uh, high school, but I'm working with ESC kids right now. SC. And, uh, yeah. Um, um, special SC, education. Special yeah, special Spe ed. Special needs. Okay, okay, okay. Special needs, special needs kid. I teach at the high school level now. But now that's kind of gone and out of the way too. So it's like, eh, you know. I also do have my own spiritual discourses class that I do on my, I have like a little Facebook page, that kind of thing, you know. Yes. So I, yes. Just, I do, I, I give my satsans once a week, that kind of thing. So you guys are more than welcome to come in if you guys want to. If you're on Facebook, you can join the school. May I say the school, Hiro? Yes. <laughs> You've yeah. got an invite and you never accepted it. <laughs> oh, it's called the, it's called the school of inner awareness and meditation or so yeah. i am interesting I'll, I'll look i'll look at that i look at that um <laughs> so we, we're talking we're we are all looking at or we all have interest in this kind of uh, non-conventional thinking uh which you're still thinking but it's non-conventional where instead of looking at things and the relationships between, uh, between things, uh, uh, we look at through things and through their relationships, we look at the nature or the essence of anything and any relationship, any group or anything. So, uh, that is a perspective that is different. It's still a perspective, but it's different. <clears throat> and it's a combination of those two different ways of looking at things, which is a conventional one. Because we're still talking about things and their relationships, and we're still talking about their essence. The only difference is that things in their aspect have a specific aspect, but the essence of anything I propose is the same one. All things are the same in in essence now that that essence is the the quid what is the essence of anything what is the nature of any phenomenon the and soul the nature i'm sorry the soul uh, yeah you can call that the soul but uh, of course that brings a lot of uh, uh yeah i'm very careful when i talk especially about abstract things or subtle things or things that are you know you can't touch or, or see like non-being uh, uh, non-arising, uh, I'm very careful to define the word or the perspective from which I, I, I use the word. So soul, mm -hmm. if you talk about soul, a lot of people are going to think is me, uh, the non-material the non me, but it's still me. Uh, and you know, Or that some people talk about our individual soul, and then there's the universal soul, Brahman, so you start talking about it. Wait, wait a minute. I mean, well, they're one and the same. The universal soul and the individual, the, the perceived individual yes. soul are one and the same. Uh, yes, no they, they have different aspects. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So again, uh, this is this is the the conversation. This is our interest. We're trying to define the soul, right? The individual soul, the 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 uh, universal soul, the, uh, the the cosmic soul. What is that soul? What is it? What? Is, how do you define that? Because that's energy, all, energy, pure energy. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, is 
And so yes, you can you can talk about that too and say, okay, well, this is pure energy. The whole the whole reality is pure energy. Exactly. Um, but but uh, what is the nature? What is the soul of energy? What is the essence? What? How do I describe, in very gen general words, uh, what is and how? What are the qualities of energy? For example, um, you can also how do I describe the indescribable? Because you know, if the essence of you know, it's it's how do you describe the ineffable, the indescribable, and you can only. <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, you can only describe it by uh, opposition. What it is not <laughs> that I can touch and feel and, and measure. So what is the quality? What is the, the, the very uh, description of not? Because everything well, is if not. If it's everything, if it's everything, like you said earlier, if it's really everything and understanding itself in different aspects, then the real question is, what it, isn't it? So if That's it's right. everything, if it's everything, then the, the question is null and void. Because it's it everything. It's in one it aspect of that. Now, in it understanding it, it cannot be understood. Like I always talk about um, people uh, uh, trying to understand through the perspective of the mind and science. Remember. The mind is a, a, a three-dimensional object, I guess, if you want to call it for lack of a better term. And what we're talking about are fourth, fifth, and sixth dimensional concepts. So in order to, to, to take a three-dimensional mind and try to understand a higher level concept requires a certain type of uh, understanding, okay? Now, let me be clear on this. The... I liken this to having a 3G phone and trying to jump onto a 5G network. It just can't be. There has to be a bridge between the two. Therefore, to understand what it is that you're talking about cannot be quantified, cannot be spoken of, cannot be compartmentalized by a three-dimensional mind. It can be understood through direct experience of what it is that you're talking about, which is what uh, would happen to me when I went to India, when I had my third eye opened, you know, and everything became a question like what happened to Buddha. What Buddha understood when he had his aha moment was that everything he did, everything that he tried to understand was completely worthless. He didn't have to. When he was asked what enlightenment was, he just looked at the guy and he said, I'm awake. Nothing more. Nothing more. All the other concepts and everything else was, you know, completely irrelevant, irrelevant to him. They were all different, you know, it's like trying to understand a tree one leaf at a time. You see? Or trying to chop down a tree one branch at a time instead of the trunk. I like to use these kind of examples. It kind of simplifies them. It kind of makes a little bit more. Sometimes it's a little too simple, but, you know, for a lot of people definitely, definitely can get for them to see what it is that I'm, that I'm trying to convey. So the direct experience, attaining that direct experience is key to understanding what it is that you're talking about, what it is that you're trying to understand. So for me, and I'm not, I'm not saying that this is the way to do it. I'm not saying that, you know, to me, whatever resonates with an individual person, if that resonates true to their heart with them, whatever it is that they're pursuing is what they're supposed to be doing. I don't judge it. I don't condemn it. I do not say it's wrong. I say more power to you. Knock yourself out. Because there's something along that path that you need to learn in order to learn that, well, maybe I need to switch gears and to jump onto another path. The one thing I've understood is that the truth that we're looking for is all around us. Therefore, it is pathless. So to truly understand what is pathless, to compartmentalize yourself to a path is only going to take you further from truth. That's what uh, Luis Del Pino uh, refers to as concilient. To, yeah, that's uh, Krishna Murti too. Yeah. To uh, bringing the different sciences, the different humanities. Uh, yeah, trying to get out of, of your own uh, science and and try to focus on on the object of uh, focus. <laughs> Yeah, or whatever, yeah. and but uh, uh, use different uh, different fields to understand it better. Modalities, to, at least, to be less dogmatic, to have a 
open mind and, and see what uh, other specialists, how they view it and not, not think of it all. Co no, there must be only one theory that, that should handle it. No, you should uh, use all theories and, and see That's that. True. Yeah. It's like a, a big elephant and, and we're all uh, the six blind men and we're touching yeah. different parts of the elephant and we're saying, oh, this, this tail, oh, this is the rope. And but you see, what, what, what I've learned is that for some people, what you were just saying, they have that dogmatic view. And you know what? What I've learned is that although that does not resonate with me, it is okay for them. So more power to them. If they want to approach it with a ritualistic, dogmatic approach, as narrow as that is, then that's where they're supposed to be. I just don't judge it anymore. It just is what it is. Go for it. If that's what you need to do, then that's what you need to do. If that's how you understand the world around you, that's how they, they I always used to friend, I have this friend that I grew up with. You know, he always, a smart kid, and we're the same age, started kindergarten and everything. We stayed friends all these years. He's always would get these killer jobs and he would always do well for himself, but he would always blow it because he struggled with addiction. And uh, all these years, you know, I kept, you know, he, he over the years, it's always been this way. Well, about six or seven years ago, he found Jesus and completely turned his life around. You know, he belongs to a, a, a very, to us would be a very narrow, dogmatic, ritualistic type of thing. But you know what? It works for him. And that's fine. And that's fine. People got to come into it on their own, which is why the old teachings always stress, work on your light. Make your light shine brighter. Because when the right. darkness comes on those around you, they instinctively look for light there's not a lot of time you got to get what you can get i mean you know i mean in terms of this this ride that we're on i i agree i heard the dalai lama say that he's like look if this is what you were raised in and, and this speaks to you then continue down that path exactly you know there's not a lot of uh, this is uh i got sober in uh, 2002 uh september 5th that's my sobriety day and um this idea of the steps, this idea of an awakening. There's not a lot of time here. This is a, this is a short ride now, uh, at least while I'm here, you know, while I'm enjoying this. So that's really my perspective as well. I mean, if, if, uh, if you can, uh, you know, wherever you're at right now, just, uh, you know, open up, open up your eyes. And so. What is your name again? Mike. My twin? I'll call you my twin. <laughs> my brother from another mother all right question when you say you know i have a short time you know we only have like a short time here when you say i who are you talking about mike, mike. this experience this ride okay but the soul is infinite correct it's true i get that but uh you know, there's this, this idea, and you talk about energy, this idea mm -hmm. of being able to absorb it. I still have that, that, that idea of that thirst or that craving, which we could talk a little bit about, but that, uh, uh, that sense of adventure, that energy that's driving me to be able to pull it in. You know, there's that aspect of nature, that wildness. Um, so that's what, that's, that's what I'm talking about. So. Okay. So when you talk, when you talk about, excuse me, or my name. Ken, I was gonna, yeah. I was, I was gonna, uh, kind of, uh, go on to your question. You know, when you talk about, I was, uh, who am I? And, and, yeah. and the soul, the soul is infinite and eternal, but the soul does not know in and of itself or in and of by itself. It doesn't know. It only knows through I, Mike, I, Ken, I, Lewis, I, Mosquito, uh, et cetera, et cetera, with a certain degree of knowledge. So the soul, as a pure being, does not know. We are the, we are the, and, and this is my view, that we are the instrument, the tool through which the soul knows itself and each each knowledge is different because each each uh, uh mind is born in a different place has a different body has different uh, you know aspects different history different everything 
but you see where I'm going with this. So when I say I, I don't have a lot of time. What Mike is saying is that the aspect of the soul, which is eternal, uh, 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 aspectualized in Mike, has a, a determined time. See, mm -hmm. so life yeah. looks at itself through holes, you know, and those holes are consciousness or aspects of itself, mm -hmm. uh, which can be a, con a, a human consciousness or it can be uh, the, the doorbell on, on your door. Yep. That's a very, it's really good if that's, you know, it, 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 again, if that's how, what works for you, that's fine. You see, my, my take on what you're saying, though, it's the opposite. It's the soul that has all the knowledge. The soul knows what it is. It's the mind that doesn't. So when you call yourself I and call yourself I as part of the body and relate to yourself in the body that you are, of course, you're not going to know because you're coming from the perspective of mind. Uh, very good. Um, uh, the, the soul knows everything or is everything potentially. So the, 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 infinite knowledge is potential but it is actualized not in infinitely it is actualized with a certain degree which is a curve from zero not knowing nothing to infinity so the soul being everything and nothing at the same time potentially has infinite knowledge and of course infinite time and space it's everything but because it is potential, it cannot know it, but through is actualized self. I recommend reading the book by uh, David Bohm, a 1980s, 1970s physicist that, that uh, spoke about uh, uh, the uh, actualized reality and non-actualized reality, but it's the same thing. And he speaks of reality as a... Um, uh, hologram mm -hmm. where like. the, when you go small, 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 the whole of reality is potentially in that like, tiny little thing. For example, in my case, in this body, in this mind, in this envelope of, of phenomena, you know, uh, atoms and, and stuff, uh, the whole of reality is potentially in there. So if you cut me up in the a trillion little pieces and you take the tiniest piece of myself which is a quantum you know of energy the whole of the energy uh, the whole of reality is there potentially not actualized that's why in physics when they go small 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 and they go into the string they find out in their formulas that the energy of space the empty space of nothing of zero kelvin is infinite that, mm -hmm. That's the, the soul that you're talking about is right there, mm -hmm. potentially, potentially, not actualized. That's why the soul, in my How view, does it actualize? Uh, because uh, of the nature of reality is, quant uh, is uh, uh, quantum. That means that zero, zero Kelvin only exists uh, for a span of time of 10 to the minus 35. Mm -hmm. in a space of 10 to the minus 35, which is the mm -hmm. Planck scale, where when you cut reality into the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest piece, uh, you see the quantum, which is zero, becoming something or a quantum with a frequency and an energy that is indescribable to us. So reality and then it has a massive expansion, correct? A massive expansion. It, it, could, it could have with a certain, with a certain mm -hmm. probability the zero can expand, that's the inflationary cosmology, you, you, you're mentioning there, that zero, which has a very tiny energy, the quantum energy, the, the, the energy of a quantum, expands, and with it, each energy of the quantum zero becomes you know, bigger and bigger and bigger, and can, uh, or does, I, I believe, at infinity and in eternity, become a bubble. A so bubble it, sounds like you're describing, it sounds like you're describing the Big Bang. Or the Big Bang theory. and the Big, the big or, yes, the Big Bang being crushed. Yeah. yeah, because in the Big Bang, the problem is that they, they don't have time before time. They, they say, okay, it's zero, they're nothing. But in my view, because reality must be 
everything and nothing, so it is eternal and infinite at the same time, there cannot be a no time. So every mm -hmm. time zero, every time uh, zero Kelvin becomes a quantum, uh, that's a world right there mm -hmm. in and of itself. Now, how big or small, it doesn't matter because it's already there potentially. The, the soul of the universe is- Now remember- infinite.